It takes a fluke to find the biggest poo on the planet. Today's deep dive for scat takes us across the oceans of the world, where giant mariners traverse ancient migration routes, leaving a nutrient-rich stream in their wake. A WWF scientist named Chris Johnson follows their trail, because today we set sail to tell the tale of a whale. I'm Carlo Ricci, and this is Scat Chat with WWF. Join me in WWF as we get to the bottom of what fascinating things scat or poo can teach us about the animals that made it, the homes they live in, and the problems they face. We'll also chat about what you can do at home to help your favourite animals thrive in the wild. Today I'm talking to Chris Johnson, global lead of WWF's initiative to protect whales and dolphins. To chat about all things whale poo and how these world travellers could be helping keep the oceans healthy with their scat. Chris, welcome to Scat Chat. Great to be here, Carlo. Your position with WWF is you're the global lead of the Protecting Whales and Dolphin Initiative. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So we have a global conservation program looking at uh, that is responsible for whales and dolphins worldwide. And it involves a number of different people working across the globe. So I'm based here in Melbourne, Australia, but I work with a team of uh, scientists, conservationists, policy experts, uh, campaigners on every continent in the world. Now, Chris, this question may seem obvious, but imagine I've never seen a whale before. What does a whale look like? What is a whale? Oh boy, so a whale is a mammal. So it's, uh, and some of the largest animals on earth are whales. So like blue whales, for example, is, uh, they're the largest animal on earth. They're about 30 to 32 meters in length. These are the big Antarctic blue whales that we have in the Southern hemisphere. And to communicate how big they are, it's, you have to compare it to things like their flukes or tails are the width of a small airplane. Their heart uh, is about the size of a small car. If you were a small child, say one or two, three years old, you could crawl through the arteries of a blue whale. So these, these animals are absolutely massive. And um, I've, had, I've been lucky I've been able to study whales around the world um, and see them up close, both from a boat, but also filming them underwater. And it is abs- they're absolutely spectacular to see in the wild. And what's the smallest whale? So you've got whales and dolphins. The smallest whale is a, is a minke whale. And that is about seven, eight meters in length. You you find minke whales around the world. You find them in the Antarctic. You can swim with dwarf minke whales on the Great Barrier Reef. They're they're small to large. Um, And these whales, they're called baleen whales. And what they do, they're they're unique because they, these large animals that feed on some of the tiniest creatures on earth, which are are krill and copepods. So this giant animal uh, feeds on these tiny, say, krill, which is the size of your pinky. These copepods, that's krill? That's, another, that's the kind of family that they belong to? So krill are crustaceans. Um, you've, krill are found worldwide. Um, so whales in the southern hemisphere, say humpback whales, uh, blue whales, minke whales, whales that you see in Australia. Uh, right now, they're heading back south to the Antarctic to feed. They go to feed there. They, they feed primarily on krill. Some humpback whales um, feed on fish in some areas of the world. Uh, Other whales, like bowhead whales and North Atlantic right whales, they feed on tiny copepods. But krill is a a prime driver of of food for the big baleen whales. Now, you mentioned a couple of different species of whales there. How many species are there? So of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, there are about 90. But we're still discovering species, believe it or not. There's a group of whales called beaked whales, they're like giant dolphins, and they live offshore, uh, primarily in deep underwater canyon trenches. And we and we just don't know a lot about beaked whales, and, and we're still discovering species. There's a, a whale called the rice whale, which is a subspecies in the Gulf of Mexico that was just discovered um, about a year and a half ago. And, and it's a good news, bad news story. So we're learning so much about our oceans, discovering a lot about whales, dolphins, but with this rice whale, it's actually critically endangered. There's only 100 left. So we just discovered it, but it's in big trouble. Ocean is an amazing place, but it has a lot of mysteries to it as well. 
Chris, you might be able to answer something that has plagued me for many years. Like when I was at uni, I remember reading these stories about unidentified large sounds under mm-hmm. the water and they were trying to work out if they were created by animals or by, you know, volcanic eruptions and things. Are some of these mystery sounds thought to belong to potential mystery whales we haven't found yet? Oh, potentially, yes. I mean, we there's been a lot of research around bioacoustics, so the sounds that whales produce. Uh, blue whales, they, they actually vocalize at levels that we can't hear. Um, but we have special underwater microphones called hydrophones that we can listen for the animals. So it actually comes from the military, where the, the first work on, say, humpback whales um, in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, was documented by these special underwater microphones listening for submarines. And they heard these weird vocalizations in the background. I used to work for a scientist named Dr. Roger Payne. And in the late 60s, Roger and his wife Katie discovered that these vocalizations that humpbacks would make are actually songs. It's like songs we hear on the radio, but uh, they sound very different when a humpback whale sings them. Right. Like they repeat and they you know, multiple whales will sing the same song. Is that the vibe? Well, not only that. So the, the, the males primarily sing. Uh, to attract females, we think. But these songs uh, we've been learning over the years are quite complex. And um, there's actually some research that came out recently showing that songs have been traveling the globe. So it's almost like a top 40 hit that uh, was really, you know, really popular in Atlantic, and now it's showing up in the Pacific. So it's, you know, it's why is that happening? We don't know, but um, it's quite complex and uh, pretty amazing to listen to. Now, I don't want to get too conspiratorial here, Chris, but I mean, you you said that in the 60s they discovered these songs and then they started in the Atlantic at Spreads Pacific. Did the Beatles steal whale songs and just turn them into English pop melodies? I don't know, but they they were, you know, the whale song in the 70s was a key driver to uh, this, the whole Save the Whales movement. And that really um, gained a lot of popularity. I think National Geographic released this flexi record in the 70s as one of the most popular or the most pressed flexi records on earth, apparently. Of whale song. Of whale, of whale song. A beautiful version of Hey Jude as well. Yeah. But what's cool is it's actually whale songs in space, believe it or not. So they put a um, whale song on the Voyager uh, spacecraft that's hurling out across the universe right now as an example of um, we have examples of human culture. And there's whale song on, on the Voyager uh, spacecraft, which is pretty cool. Do the whales get copyright for the track that was sent out on the Voyager? You know, I hope so. And, you know, maybe somewhere they're, they're collecting those royalties, I hope. It would be fun if, you know, the Voyager did contact extraterrestrial life and they came to Earth and like, we're not interested in any of the human stuff. We're here for the whales, <laughs> right. baby. We want some more of that song. We need new hits. That's right. <laughs> you don't come to a knife fight without a knife. Similarly, you don't come to Scat Chat without some scat. And I want to talk a little bit more about this whale scat, Chris. What does it look like? I mean, I'm picturing all kinds of things when I think about whale scat, but let's go straight to the source. What does it look like? Well, it depends on what whales are feeding on. So um, I've, I've had to jump into a whole big plume of blue whale poo in the past. You've, you've had poop. to? I've had to. So, like someone's got to jump in there, <laughs> Chris. Gotta it's going to have to be you. We all drew straws, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so when they when they poo at the surface, uh, it, the color of it looks uh, is very much um, like people. Uh, it's, it's what you eat is what you see. And so uh, with krill, they're kind of pink. So blue whale poo, when they're feeding on krill, will be pinkish. And it'll be a bit grainy. Um, and what we do, uh, scientists like, they want to understand what's in whale poo and what whales are feeding on. So, look, you know, people draw straws, take a little net, they jump in the ocean, scoop it up, and then we put it in some plastic bags to, to send back to the lab. It is solid whale poo or like, is it like a big, big ballooning pink cloud in the sea? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit crusty. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, and it breaks apart really easily. So you, you've got to get it quick. So when a whale poos and you got to jump in right there. So it's, you are in a, you are in a, you are in a big plume. What would you compare it to? When you say crusty, am I thinking on the cornflakes ends of thing? Or am I thinking more of the 
baked cornflake, <laughs> little little patty cake kind of vibe. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like a Rice Krispies treat. You know that oh, uh, yeah. it's kind of, just <laughs> looks a bit weird, and you, you know, it's not uniform at all. It's not like a ball of something, or it's a, it's um, it's very uh, porous, I guess, as well. How interesting! Yeah. And you got to dive in and get these. Is there a little bit of luck involved in? In netting one, if you're diving into this big pink plume, I imagine you can't see very much and you're just swinging a net around until something connects. Well, it's, you know, the net they give you is very small too. It's about the size of your hand. <laughs> like so one of those ones that you use to get out get out stuff in a little fish tank. That's right. It's yeah. one of those fish tank nets. But it's, uh, you know, got a really fine uh, net so it can it can get everything there. Um, it's, yeah, it's, you, you can see it, you know, so when they do a big poo at the surface, you, it's a big red plume, or it can be uh, a little bit reddish brown too. So with, um, I've also had to do that with sperm whales and uh, sperm whales don't feed on krill. They're, they're big tooth whales, they're like giant dolphins and they feed on giant squid, two to 3000 meters at depth. And so um, we know that because in their poo are squid beaks. And so there'll be a collection of squid Gee. beaks in amongst this kind of uh, Rice Krispies treat, you know, <laughs> solid mass that dissipates really quickly. But it doesn't really smell though. That's the thing. It, it doesn't, you know, doesn't have a, a really horrible smell. All right, Chris, this is why we're here. What impact does whale poo have on the environment? Well, if we're going to talk about whale poo, we need to talk about something called the whale pump. That's exactly the answer I was looking for, Chris. <laughs> Let's talk about the whale pump. It's all about the whale pump. So what's the whale pump? So uh, whales will feed at depth and they kind of do this circular um, pump where they they feed on their prey, um, say it's tiny uh, krill. They'll come up to the surface to breathe. Whales are mammals like us, so they have to breathe air at the surface of the ocean. After they breathe, they usually poo. And that poo is full of good stuff for our oceans, um, specifically iron that has benefits uh, for phytoplankton. And that phytoplankton helps um, capture about 40% of the CO2 in the atmosphere and produce half the oxygen on Earth. So it's almost like every second breath we take. Every second breath we take, thank you, ocean. <laughs> yeah. You want to get matching whale pump tattoos, Chris? Let's do it. I think it'd just be a sick design for a tattoo, you know? You can see it. It's <laughs> like there's a whale, there's some phytoplankton in there. Yeah, man, you and me. You know, whales are almost these giant fertilizers that are, and especially with, with this map that we produced on their migration, it's really important worldwide. They're these global travelers and their poo is very, very important to ocean productivity. In the Southern Ocean, uh, it's, it's, the Southern Ocean is iron poor. So uh, there's been research done around uh, commercial whaling, looking at how many whales there were. Um, Pre-commercial whaling, we think about four to five million animals. Um, you take wow couple million out of that equation, and that's a big impact on the health of our oceans. But again, this is growing research, um, and you know, it just shows how vital, well, little we know about how our ocean works, but how important the marine life is to our oceans, which have benefits to ourselves. But with carbon, that's, that's another one. So throughout their lives, whales are storing carbon as they breathe, and when they die and sink to the bottom of the ocean, that's a big carbon capture. And over their lifetime, it's been calculated that um, they capture the same amount of carbon as thousands of trees. Each individual whale. Yeah, each individual whale. So if you think wow. about it, if we work hard to, for species to bounce back and recover, they're gonna be a big ally in terms of keeping our ocean healthy and making sure that um, we're capturing a lot of carbon. Even on the note of them being great fertilizers, I mean, I have two whales working for me in my orchard and it has never <laughs> looked better, let me tell you that. Big tick for the whale pump from me. The, the apples I'm getting, Chris, they're beautiful. <laughs> it's all connected. A lot of the um, conservation work we do, believe it or not, has fed into this. Um, so for example, a lot of the kind of supporter funded work that we've done in the Antarctic, we've used uh, new technologies to study whales. Uh, so for example, we put these really cool um, digital tags that are, are the size of an iPhone. They have four suction cups on the back. We stick them on the back of a whale and they have a special camera on them. And this tech allows us to look at how whales feed and where they feed underwater. And this, it stays on the whale for about a day or two and then it pops off. We go collect the tag, 
We download the data and um, there was a publication out that combined 300 tags and um, we could really quantify how much whales actually eat. And from that, scientists do calculations on uh, their role in the ecosystem and that lost role uh, from commercial whaling. So that's the really cool thing about science and conservation is sometimes we're doing, we're looking at one avenue and that's actually gonna help us inform something totally new about our oceans, which is pretty phenomenal. Are whales generally found in colder places or are they kind of spread? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, large whales say in Australia that we see um, on a seasonal basis. Right now it's humpback whale season. So we see a lot of humpback whales during our winter time. And so humpback whales are in uh, tropic waters. They travel up the coast on the west and east coast uh, to their breeding grounds um, to, to give birth and to mate. So it's and to rest as well. So that's it's kind of a time that they kind of uh, it's like a holiday in Queensland. Um, yeah, they just head north. They head north for a right. bit of a break in the winter time. School holidays. Yeah, they're like country country people from northern New South Wales. <laughs> That's right. And they do this worldwide. So in the southern hemisphere right now, there are uh, humpback whales in tropical waters um, as we speak off of the coast of Ecuador, Australia, Africa. And they turn around and do the same thing. They go down south to feed. So when they're hungry, they... They store up, they're, they're ready to go, and they go down to the Antarctic, which are these really rich feeding grounds of, of Antarctic krill. And they spend uh, three to four months there. Uh, they bulk up, and they, they really you know, bulk up and get fat. And uh, then they turn around, they use those fat reserves all year, and they head back up, up north. It's my kind of lifestyle. Yeah, and so we did this report called uh, Protecting Blue Corridors, which was the first ever map of whale movement uh, globally. So we worked with about 50 different research groups. We pulled together a, a thousand satellite tags of, of whales from different species, from blue whales to humpback whales to sperm whales uh, to fin whales, which are the second largest animal on earth, and looked at these migration routes or whale superhighways, as we're calling. And uh, it's pretty incredible to see, you know, we, especially with humpback whales, we know a lot about their movement. And this is also happening in Northern Hemisphere too with, with humpback whales. They're, they're doing the same thing, but, it, but in reverse. So you know, right now they're in their polar regions feeding. And so in their winter, they're back in uh, breeding grounds. So it's, it's a pretty cool. So I think winter breeding, summer feeding is how it works. Just to break down these super highways that you're talking about, how wide are these highways? What do they look like? How long are they? When we talk about ships moving around them, how far out of their way are they having to go sometimes? Well, when we talk about whale superhighways, um, it depends on where, we're, where we are. So we'll say Australia. So humpback whales, for example, they make along the coastline, on the west coast and the east coast, they're very close to shore. So when we map these um, areas from the tropical breeding down, grounds to the uh, feeding grounds in the Antarctic, it's very kind of a tight um, highway, maybe 10 to 50 kilometers wide. They're following the kind of navigation routes and as, when they get closer to land, they tend to come closer to shore, which causes problems because we're also off the coast um, and there's some issues they have to navigate. When they leave Australian waters, they tend to spread out. So you have these like, tight highways and then it becomes um, like a mass exodus south. And then they come back together in the feeding grounds. So it come, it, it's almost like a uh, really narrow, gets wider in the hundreds of kilometers, then come, comes back uh, closer together. Um, where they're feeding. They're thousands of kilometers in length, um, and it really depends where they are. Uh, so the longest migration is about eight and a half thousand kilometers round trip, and that's from Panama to the Antarctic Peninsula in, in Western South America. So they're quite, they're huge, and it takes months to navigate these, these things, constantly in motion. It's so interesting, Chris, because I think the conception is that once whaling stopped, yep. things were great for the whales, you know? It's like, oh, yep. We, we stopped cutting them to bits. Everything's fine. It's sorted. Yeah. But it, like the, the threat is actually still there for a lot of these whale species, right? It is. And that's why we did this report is there's, we've done a great job, but there's trouble ahead. And it's really a cautionary tale of these are the things that we need to do. These are the actions we need to take right now. And we need to reduce these cumulative impacts in different ways in different regions. So some solutions may work in one area and some solutions won't. Um, and so it's, and that's where actually that's driving a lot of our conservation work here at WWF 
um, because we work globally, we can we can work in different ways with different partners to help whales and dolphins thrive. Do you think this is a good time, Chris, for me to stop dumping my fishing nets in the ocean? Uh, definitely. You don't want to dump a fishing net in the ocean. I do it for fun. It's just a <laughs> way that I like to relax. You know, I have about, I go out every Sunday and I dump between three and four, like hundred yeah. fishing nets just, just in the ocean. Everyone is just like, I'm just throwing the baggage away, you know what I mean? So you're saying I should stop doing that? Yeah, definitely you want to stop that because uh, fishing nets are made of plastic. Uh, plastic doesn't break down. Oh yeah, I buy the real heavy duty ones. Like, so yeah, yeah. you know that really heavy duty. So we, so I call kind of ghost gear those plastic, those nets really the deadliest predator in the sea because you know we we often look at great white sharks or you know as the deadliest predator out there, but it's really ghost nets. Um, ghost nets they don't break down. They can keep on killing, unfortunately, and it is a it is a is a sad way to go. Um, and you know it's a it's a it's a big problem. What are some other things that listeners could be doing other than just stopping dumping their nets every Sunday for a nice relaxing time with the family? Which, yes, Chris, I hear uh, you've, you've made your point loud and clear. I'm going to stop it. What are some other <laughs> things that listeners could do? Well, it depends who you are. So I think if you're a, uh, a government official or a government, um, there's a real big movement around something called 30 by 30. So we're trying to protect 30% of our ocean by 2030. Why is that important? Well, Whales have this great range between their critical habitats and, the, and on these migration routes or super highways. So if we set aside important ocean areas for wildlife, that can help our ocean thrive and that'll have benefits for our oceans, for whales and ourselves. So that's one thing that governments can do. What industry can do is stop throwing nets in the ocean, you know, making sure that, we, that plastic doesn't enter the sea, making sure that we really take care of the way we fish and where we fish. Um, and some methods are worse for whales and dolphins than others, um, especially net-based fisheries, like gill nets. Um, we need to stop reducing gill nets wherever possible. Third, shipping. So shipping routes, um, there are some movements by some shipping companies to move their um, primary shipping route around uh, critical uh, areas for whales. That was actually done last week by MSC, which is one of the largest shipping companies in the world, um, wow. they, they voluntarily said, okay, we see the data that have been recommended by scientists and, and NGOs such as WWF. Uh, we're going to move our, uh, sh our shipping operations further south, um, which is going to reduce the impact of ship strikes by 95%. So there's some areas where these just south coast of Sri Lanka is an incredible area of diversity for whales and dolphins. And it's also one of the busiest shipping lanes on earth. Um, so we're hoping that other shipping companies can take uh, action as well. But then for people at home, you know, this work we do at WWF, it is, it involves a range of people. So we work, you know, I, I often say, you know, I've got the best job in the world and every day is different. I wear a different hat. Some days I'm out working in Antarctica, working with uh, humpback whales, using drones to understand their health putting tags on them to understand how they feed. Sometimes I'm writing reports. Sometimes I'm going talking to governments about how they can take action dressed up in a suit and tie. And, um, and that science to advocacy is really important. And that is all funded by supporters. So really how people at home can help is supporting organizations like WWF do this work. It's all supporter driven. You know, we rely, all of this work is from listeners out there um, supporting what we do. So one way people can help is actually visiting uh, WWF dot org dot au forward slash uh, scat chat to find out some more information on, on ways they can help. So Chris, one thing I like to do at the end of every episode is just talk about some of our favorite scat facts. You know, this is a scat chat. We're all about the scat. So what is your favorite scat fact? So my favorite scat fact has to do with the role whales play in a uh, connection of their poo to enhancing phytoplankton uh, that enhances oxygen. In this amazing role, in this cool whale pump that's happening out in our oceans, that whales are helping our oceans produce every other breath we take or over half the oxygen we breathe on Earth. It's going to make my scat fact look terrible. <laughs> you know, you're talking about how much, how much oxygen whales are creating. My scat fact is that sloths, they only poo every few days, but when they do poo, they think it's about a third of their body weight. And the interesting thing about sloths is when they poo, that's the only time they kind of come out of the tree is to do a poo. Even though 
that makes them the most vulnerable. They would be much safer being in the tree. They don't really understand why they do it. But that's that's sloths and their nice. scat. Yeah, they're not making any oxygen. Ah, oh, you really make me look like an idiot out here, Chris. Well, Chris, thank you so much for coming along to Scat Chat and talking about whale scat with us and cool maps that we can check out of where these whales are migrating around the world. Great. Thanks, Carlo. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me for Scat Chat with WWF. If you want to find out more about how you can help whales travel the globe, head to wwf.org.au forward slash scat chat to get involved and follow us here to stay in the loop. Join me next time as I get to the bottom of an incredible story of a wallaby that was thought to be locally extinct until an exciting scat discovery suggested otherwise.